My uh, presentation today is rather uh, broad and general compared with uh, those of uh, my colleagues uh, uh, following after, after my presentation. But I, I, I think uh, for the uh, objective of the conference, it will give you some things to, uh, to think about. Because your country, Poland, has just recently joined the uh, European Union, and I'm sure that will take you through the kind of uh, path in the uh, coming history as we have been experienced in Japan. So uh, please excuse for my presentation being a little shallower than others. Okay, now first of all, uh, I'd like you to uh, briefly introduce uh, the NIME, National Institution of uh, Multimedia Education. Uh, not with my own words, but uh, in, in the uh, video. As we enter the 21st century, the speed of media technology development is accelerating more than ever. Organizations of higher education require research into the latest media developments and methods of practical application of research results for education. The National Institute of Multimedia Education, NIME, is a research organization that exists to realize this purpose. There's an open university in Japan. We, we could call it University of the Air, rather unique, old, <laughs> strange name, uh, which was uh, created uh, in uh, early 1980s, model after UK Open University. And the NIME uh, was, was founded by the government uh, five years prior to the actual foundation of the university to be a supportive organization, research organization, to uh, uh, research and develop uh, uh, coursewares uh, for the university classes. But ever since the uh, current at the time in the distance education has changed rapidly, Soon enough, we have come into the, uh, the age where the education gears into more use of uh, telecommunication or technologies, not like the uh, broadcasting media, which has been heavily used by our uh, Open University. So, NIME has since been reorganized several times, most recently in, in past month, to, to, be, uh, you know, to be an institution independent of the university, to, to become a more international uh, research organization. In order for you to understand why the things are happening the way they are now in Japan, I would like you to uh, take you through some of the historic uh, paths, uh, and especially this, uh, the so-called internationalization fever that has been sweeping through uh, you know, Japan for the, for the past two decades or so, which actually prompted uh, adopting uh, more uh, use of uh, ICE, uh, information communication technologies and then uh, bringing about uh, uh, more courses by distance mode in, in Japan. Probably I'm, I'm the only non-engineer academic here. Most of you, I, I'm sure that your background is like, like a Dr. Galvez, uh, as engineer. But I come from a rather soft humanistic uh, area. My specific uh, spe uh, spe uh, uh, specialized area is uh, communication, uh, humanistic communication, intercultural communication to be more specific, and also international relations. As everybody knows, uh, since the, uh, the, the whole world has come into uh, to, uh, the space uh, 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 age with the uh, Sputnik uh, uh, boosted in, into the air by the Soviet Union in, in 1957, the, this global village concept uh, gradually uh, you know, started getting ad advocated. In, in the 1960s, George McLuhan at the Toronto University started uh, becoming a main advocate of, of the uh, concept. Then in the political scenes, 1970s, uh, the concept of interdependence uh, came about. And this is when Japan realized that, uh, <clears throat> you know, we are just no longer one nation uh, having nothing to do with the rest of the world, just trying to uh, recover from the devastation of the, you know, by the Second World War. But we are a member of international community. <coughs> and that's when the Japanese uh, government started uh, changing its uh, uh, foreign policies. I understand the information society was, 
but you know, started uh, spreading around in, in the United States in, in, uh, in the middle uh, 1970 or so, when I was a graduate student there. And uh, as, like, like most of other uh, concepts that I thought, it, it, came, it was coined by some American, the North American scholar, but actually, the information society was <coughs> first coined by my colleague, Japanese scholar at the Keio University. The drastic changes in international politics with, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall and so forth, now the world started exploring for a new world order. And, and then scholars started talking about all sorts of scenarios. In the meantime, uh, along with this exploration for the new uh, uh, world order, we have come into the, the age of the IT revolution, the so-called IT revolution, and then globalization has become a key, term, key uh, uh, concept. Not only in the polit uh, political or economic spheres, but in education, mm -hmm. we started talking about transnational networks, and then multiculturalism has become, an, become another important keyword, as, as well as international collaboration and then coexistence. Politicians, international relations scholars have been arguing about what this globalization concept is all about. It, it was brought about with the advent of a highly advanced information society characterized by the free flow of information. And when we started talking about globalization, we talked about all sorts of rosy things. The world is going to be so, so much better than before. People are going to be so much happier. But actually, you know, there's not only the positive side of the global, uh, globalization, there are some drawbacks in the globalization. That's, yes. we, we talk about the free flow of information, but uh, as we try to exercise uh, the flow of information, the more the world has become uh, divided, the so-called digital divide. Some others argue that the globalization is nothing but a part of a world strategy by the, uh, by the United States, the only superpower after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that's what has taken to the world today. The coming of our IT revolutions, uh, the, we have started enjoying all sorts of uh, information communications, which naturally better uh, at every phase of our society, every way of our living. Now, the world has been saturated with the email, uh, you know, going multi-directionally all over the place. People, you know, the business and the commerces that are doing using, uh, you know, uh, e e-things, e-shopping, e-love has become very common in North America as well as in Japan. Lots of couples have been created by communicating via uh, electronic uh, communication. Now, we have some people are fearful of the coming of an uh, e-state. The electronic power will soon, might soon enough uh, take, you know, uh, control the government. <laughs> well, that started happening in Japan too. Now, but in Japan, uh, one area that uh, we still feel that we are far behind uh, other, uh, we, our counterparts in the advanced part of the world is e-education, e-learning. You may wonder why you know, Japan is, can be uh, uh, behind in the e-learning because all the technologies used at every open university, all the distant faculties around the world are made in Japan. Sony and you know, Hitachi and all that. But in actual application of the technologies for our own uh, education, Japan has not exercised as much as the rest of the world, even compared with our Asian uh, neighbors. Okay, now here I'd like to uh, just uh, show you uh, uh, some, some, a, a brief uh, overview of a historic, uh, uh, historical movements, how Japan has come to be where we are now. Unlike most of other uh, neighbors in Asia, uh, Japan, uh, when, when getting through, uh, through uh, the modernization stage in the early Meiji uh, Restoration era, some hundreds, hundreds some years ago, we decided not to just give up our whole of you know, culture and language and everything, like some of the countries in Southeast Asia. But we, we hold on to our, the very core of our culture, but adopt as much as possible the Western technologies and knowledge. 
And that's how we modernized ourselves and became very successful. But in the end, the mixture of this Japanese tradition uh, and then uh, uh, Western technology, technologies brought Japan to a very uh, sad uh, ending. At the end of the Second World War, <coughs> that, that devastated Japan as well as most of the Western New York. Now, uh, Japan had to uh, reconstruct itself, the so-called reconstruction period. And soon enough, the Japan, Japanese society, as well as the most of the rest of the world, has been heavily getting influenced by the so-called Americanization, with American popular uh, culture coming into our uh, uh, life. Okay, now during this Americanization, Japan was heavily uh, 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 dependent upon the United States for the very existence up until, uh, uh, I would say, around 1970s. From 1960s through uh, uh, mid-1970s was the time that the, that the United States was heavily suffering uh, uh, because of the, the Vietnam War. And then that's when uh, the Americans started uh, <coughs> criticizing, you know, for Japan for uh, being uh, the so-called uh, free rider, never taking responsibility for its, you know, own uh, uh, national defense, just hiding under U.S. nuclear umbrella. And at the same time, you know, making as much money as possible by foreign trades, you know, increasing ever the trade imbalance between Japan and America and the rest of the world. And soon enough, you know, starting in North America, the so-called Japan bashing began. The people became hyster hysterical. I remember when I was a graduate student, a number of incidents took place in the United States because of Japan bashing. In some sad cases, some, some Asian man in Detroit, which was heavily dependent upon automobile industry, was, was beaten to death by a truck, by, you know, uh, frustrated uh, uh, automobile uh, assembly worker. And then the Japanese government realized that we have to play a role expected of a, a you know, a, a world economic giant trying to uh, make contributions to international community. And that's how Internationalization started, started uh, uh, spreading around in, in the country. But in order to internationalize itself, Japan realized that, you know, up until then, Japan was known to be, uh, to be uh, one of the major ODA countries. You know, that means, meaning providing official government aid to the uh, less affluent uh, 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 countries. But in the coming of internationalism, in Japan, we realize that we don't have, we don't have a, 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 a human resources in our own society that can really take us through this internationalization. And that's how the education has become a, become a key. And then the Ministry of Education started uh, adapting all sorts of uh, uh, policies and measures in order to, to uh, bring about the reform and, uh, and uh, improvement in the educational environments, such as this. Uh, in the meantime, the area of distance education uh, <clears throat> outside of Japan, they've been, a, they've, been a, they've been a very swift progress uh, uh, made. Uh, the, most importantly, the E-learning has become uh, just ordinary practice for, for all the traditional universities in North America, Australia, and a part of the Western, Western New York. Whereas Japan, the only, the only kind of distance education that we can, we can call is the, the university of the air, other than just a few courses offered by some private universities by correspondence uh, mode. In other parts of the world, uh, they st even started talking about virtual universities, global university concept, trying to build alliances, consortia, and partnerships 
among the universities and between the academia and, and industry. So in that regard, Japan are getting even far, you know, further behind. The reasons for bringing about uh, distance education more in the traditional universities in, in the North America and other part of the world is mainly to generate or well, to reduce the cost of our, uh, uh, education and to generate additional revenue for the universities and also to cope with you know, uh, uh, com competition worldwide becoming ever uh, uh, severe. In Japan, up until 19, 1997, there was hardly any uh, concept of a distance education uh, recognized or existence in the academic community. Only then, the Ministry of Education uh, started allowing universities across the country to offer courses up to 30 credits by distance uh, mode. It's still today, uh, except for uh, just a few handful uh, elite universities, there are any, hardly any integral ICT-based teaching and learning uh, practices in Japan. There's hardly any uh, integral te technical support provided to, uh, <coughs> to uh, 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 develop uh, distance education in, in most of the Japanese universities. Well, uh, it has to do with some cultural differences too. You know, ja J J Japan has, has, has made its progress by not distincting, distinguishing professionals like in the Western world. You know, we, we, what we required was rather than a specialist, but a generalist, we can, we can you know, take up uh, anything that, that uh, you know, is required. And that's true of the, the academic communities too. So oftentimes when I invite my colleagues from overseas to Nime, National Institute of Multimedia Education. The, the, the most of the young people who help them hook up uh, computers are not just the, not the technical uh, stuff, but uh, you know, the colleagues, uh, associate professors, uh, research associates, which surprise them. Now, just briefly, uh, higher education system in Japan, now uh, we have about uh, about uh, close to 700 uh, campus-based universities, uh, senior universities, four-year universities, and ab about 600 uh, two-year uh, uh, colleges. And then we have a uh, uh, College of Technology, which is uh, equivalent, equivalent of your uh, poly, poly, Polytech College, uh, which, which is the reason that prompts to uh, further use of uh, uh, ICTs to uh, increase en enrollment by aiming not just the school leavers, but to, to uh, lure more of adults in the real world. And for that, ICT really started becoming, becoming to play a major role. Now, speaking of the uh, courses offered through internet compared with you know, our North American uh, counterparts. You know, there are very few uh, universities who are involved in offering courses through internet. Now, other than just a lack of uh, media literacy on the part of our professors, there may be some cultural reasons for, for this. Uh, because Japanese are not, not really used to the communicating through uh, you know, machines, but rather we prefer communicating you know, interactively, face to face. Now, in Japan, unlike <clears throat> the, the most, the, most, of the, most of the world, we are uh, heavily using uh, uh, synchronous uh, uh, mode for distance education. And uh, namely, the video conferencing technologies. And these are the number of the universities that have been involved in, the, in offering courses by uh, video conferencing technology. And then uh, most of these courses are offered through the, uh, tech, the, uh, the technology developed 
at NIME called uh, SCS, which stands for Space Collaboration System. It's a, it's a, a satellite educational network system that covers throughout the whole of Japan. I would like to uh, talk about and show you some of the technologies developed and, and uh, utilized at NIME. Like I said, space collaboration system is the main technology that uh, <clears throat> we have developed and then started providing to, to, to universities in, in the world uh, and, and the whole of Japan. Started in 1996, SCS is a network system that connects universities using a telecommunications satellite. In the first year, only 37 educational organizations were networked under the system, but presently more than 120 organizations, such as national, public and private universities, national colleges of technology, and inter-university organizations nationwide have joined the network and the number of participants is increasing. SCS was developed by NIME as an interactive system that allows images to be sent and received simultaneously. No radio specialists are required at the VSAT stations because of simplified system operations. As the hub station, NIME administers and operates overall network system control of the VSAT stations installed at member organizations. SCS was developed by uh, my colleague and characterized by uh, four things, wide coverage, simultaneity, uh, two-way interaction, and, and very easy operation. It was developed so that the faculty, whoever use it, can operate it at the same time giving a, giving a lecture or presentation you know, all by himself without uh, relying upon technical uh, assistance. But that's, having said that, that's, that's not really, not really uh, uh, true because some of the uh, social uh, scientists, uh, humanists, uh, still <laughs> so, uh, you know, find it so difficult to operate any kind of a machine. But anyway, you know, it's been widely used among universities for distance education in, in, in these you know, purposes. But it was originally uh, developed not for uh, the use of uh, for distance education, but as, a, as, as an interactive uh, tool uh, in research purposes for uh, collaboration, connecting, connecting SES to uh, various other uh, networks. But this SES contributed to, to bring about the changes in the actual uh, teaching and learning environments and innovating the ways of teaching and learning in the most of the universities that started using uh, this technology. So, the SCS makes it different from the, uh, from the uh, ordinary video conferencing uh, systems uh, which are used strictly as a de delivery tool for distance uh, teaching and learning in, in other countries. And also, like I said, uh, uh, I have been traveling around the whole uh, world, major institutions across, across the world, but I've never come across with a system such as SCS. And, you know, everybody who learn about SCS and who has actually come to Japan to see the system, how it operates, it, they envy, but in the end they say, oh, but, you know, in our country, this never could, could be done because, you know, in academic community, self-autonomy is so, you know, uh, it's important. I'd like to show you, just to impress upon Japanese technology, <clears throat> one of the uh, <clears throat> uh, one-time event that uh, took place in November uh, 2001, uh, combining SCS technology and connecting it to, uh, to uh, International Space Station up in the air, providing an opportunity for uh, uh, students across the country to get them involved in the questions and answers uh, with uh, astronauts. Very ex exciting uh, project, but uh, heavily costly. We were presided over the first Japanese student, astronaut. Masayuki Sakata, Sakata Masayuki Kun, ask. Please ask a question. Two years ago, 
We could see Leonid's uh, meteor shower. I was very excited to see the meteor shower from the ISS space station. How could you see, how it appeared to you? How was uh, the uh, meteor shower like from the space? ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。ミテオシャワー。
one thing that uh, characterizes e-learning is that it it's, it's increases ever the, uh, the fierce competition among the institutions, not only within the one country, but all around the world. Now, Japan is perhaps in, the, in most, of, most, most of the Asian countries, Japan is the only country that has not been infiltrated by the major uh, educational providers uh, in, in, in uh, North America or Can Canada, US or Australia who have successfully done so in Southeast Asia, South Pacific uh, Island countries and so forth. That's because, that's because Japan is, although Japan has emerged to be, a, to, to be a technological and economical giant in the world, but of, 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 of all the uh, industry, I mean, uh, major uh, successful uh, part of the world, Japan is the only, only non-Western uh, <laughs> English speaking uh, country, you know, language is still become, is still, still posing a, a serious problem in internationalizing uh, 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 the country. But ironically, that's the very reason that, uh, that keeps uh, overseas uh, competitors uh, from uh, coming into Japanese uh, educational market. Okay, my last. <laughs> conclusion, which I say all over, whatever I'm invited to, the most importantly, e-learning, in, in, in uh, promoting e-learning, you have to be really careful whether it really caters to the actual needs of the local communities. E-learning oftentimes, you know, without, even without ill intentions, destroy the local cultures. Just brought about, you know, the, some of the, country, the Asian countries you know, quickly adopted a Western way, American way of uh, e-learning, uh, technologies, models, the concepts, and along with them came Western value system. So that's, we have to be careful with. And here in Poland, uh, just having gained the membership in the Western, uh, I mean, uh, the European Union, I guess you have a, you have a lot of issues to be addressed uh, Perhaps I might name it the Europeanization <laughs> in successfully, uh, you know, uh, unifying the, the whole of Europe. And education will certainly be the key. Okay, thank you very much.